Hey guys, Patel Mike Whiskey here, and today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about governors. Now, I'm still personally figuring out the governor mechanic, which is kind of why I wasn't super ready to do this sort of analysis and stuff like that. But I'm going to go through and talk about all of the abilities based on my experiences and what abilities I think are the strongest and the most abusable ways to use those abilities that I've seen in my games. Now, keep in mind, I still haven't played, for example, a religious victory in the expansion. I'm working my way through playing all the civs again and playing all the different victory types. So there's gaps in my knowledge. I don't have the full set of information that I need to be making this sort of analysis. So just keep that in mind. Uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to talk about the single most powerful ability and governor in the game. And that's Magnus. Now, Magnus is, I think, deeply misunderstood by people. I think people completely undervalue Magnus when he is very, very clearly the most powerful, the most powerful governor in the game, full stop. There is no competition. There is nobody who is even remotely as good as Magnus, no matter how much you invest in them, because Magnus gets his most powerful ability straight away. All this, like, Magnus could literally have just this feature and none of these, and he would still be better than everyone else, okay? Because Groundbreaker is what multiplies your chops when you chop a feature with a builder. So you get 100% yields from plot harvests and feature removals in this city. This ability is so crazy powerful that I can't even really comprehend um, a way to properly explain it. But I'm going to try. So let's say you have a forest, okay? And you chop it for 100 production. You chop the forest, you get 100 production. Magnus, let's say the builder, you got five, you got a five charge builder and the builder cost you 100 production, okay? So that means you exchanged 20 production, which is, you know, how much each build charge cost you for another 100 production, which means you're making a profit. You're making a profit there of 80 production off a builder charge. That's incredible. That's so nice. You could put that towards whatever you want, okay? Magnus takes that profit and multiplies it by two or yeah, multiplies by two. Essentially doubles the value that you get. Let's try and remember how to go to the next slide here. Oh god, stop. Um, so if you add Magnus into the equation, your chop goes from 100 to 200. That's crazy. That's so powerful. Okay. Now that in itself doesn't seem like a very big deal. You know, okay, you double your chops, but it's only in a local city. And it's like, yeah, but there's a thing called production overflow and production multipliers. And that's what makes it so powerful. So something I think people don't know is that this production that you chop can get multiplied by policy cards, like, for example, limes. So if you chop for 200 production with Magnus, with the limes card while building an ancient wall, you get 400 production. Think about that. An average city, an average city might produce somewhere between like 15 to 30 production per turn. If it's like, if it has a good few hills and stuff like that, and it's reasonably well developed. Like that's an average, an average quality city. You're getting 400 production in a single turn for a 20, a 20 production investment in a build charge. That is insane. That's insane. It's nuts how powerful this is. Okay. Now, again, this just seems like you get a bunch of production. Whoop de do. What are you going to do with it? Like, you know, what am I going to do with 400 production towards walls? And it's like, dude, it's, it's not the walls. The walls are just a way for you to get the production because you can abuse the overflow. What you do is you put in a card like limes. Okay. You put Magnus in the city and then you build walls up until it's one turn from being finished. Let's say you're producing 10 production per turn. You get it to 70 of 80 production. And then you chop with this card slotted in to net you 400 production. 10 of that production goes into the walls and then 390 of it goes into overflow. That 390 production, you can use that to build wonders. You can use that to build districts. You can use that to build units. You can use that to build anything. That's why Magnus is so powerful. No other, um, no other governor has the potential to produce so much production on demand as Magnus. Okay, that's why Magnus should always be your first choice in every game. Um, if I remember, at the end of the video, I will put in 
a little bit of me like showing some examples of this Magnus chop abuse. But Magnus is 100% the most powerful guy in the expansion because of this one ability. And do not underestimate Magnus. He is so goddamn strong. Now, with regards to Magnus's other abilities, um, because of the way you use Magnus, this ability, Surplus Logistics, is worthless. Because with the 100% yields from Plot Harvest and Feature Removals, you're going to want to be moving Magnus around and chopping stuff out. But the Surplus Logistics um, means you're going to want to have him sitting still. And that means these things are antagonistic. You cannot, you cannot be taking advantage of both of these things to their fullest extent at the same time. So that's why I would never, ever recommend going for Surplus Logistics. Because this ability is so goddamn powerful... Um, this, this ability is so goddamn powerful that it just makes this ability obsolete. And then, by extension, Industrialist is also obsolete, which it isn't really that good to begin with. Um, but just because it's on the pathway here, this becomes worthless. The second ability that I think is worth talking about on Magnus is Provision. This is actually pretty damn good, uh, mainly for the settlers trained in the city do not consume a population, because it means you can chop out a bunch of settlers all at once, using the um, overflow abuse mechanics or, 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 well, I suppose settlers kind of already have a plus 50% card, so you don't need to really do overflow abuse. But it means you can chop out, you can chop out a bunch of settlers with the provision card really, really fast. Uh, and then his third most powerful ability is the Black Marketeer. Uh, this is really, really nice if you want to do an early game timing push. For example, if you're playing Genghis Khan and you somehow manage to not get any horses... Um, not needing strategic resources and then chopping out a bunch of units is really, really nice. So Magnus just gives you a lot of flexible options in the early game with regards to chopping forests in order to make um, things happen on the map in terms of either conquest or settling or just wonders and stuff like that. So that's why Magnus is a top tier. Magnus is the top tier governor, 100%. Um, I would say in every single game, you're going to want to put at least one point in Magnus in maybe... More often than not, you're going to want to put two points in Magnus if you plan on chopping out settlers. If you don't, don't bother about it. And if you're doing some sort of early game military push that's dependent on a strategic resource, you're going to want to put three governor titles in Magnus. But always, always put one, sometimes two, and rarely three. Uh, these other abilities? Worthless. Don't even bother with them, in my opinion. Um, they're good in the sense that they have potential, but the problem is that the um, opportunity cost of going for these in comparison to these abilities and other governors is just too high. So that's Magnus. Magnus is number one. So, oddly enough, there is a clear number one in my mind, but there isn't really a clear number two. Because the value that a lot of the people provide is situational. So, I'll give you a couple of examples. If we take a look at um, Victor, obviously, Vic Victor is Victor is a good governor. He's good at keeping your cities alive. He's good at defending, right? Increases the city garrison by five. Uh, garrison commander gives you plus five combat strength. All this sort of stuff is... Th these are all really, really nice. But again, um, the reason the reason Victor isn't that good... And I should clarify here, I'm talking about playing against the AI on Didi. Um, the reason he isn't that good is because the AI is easily manipulated and beaten without Victor. Right? Against players, I could imagine Victor is a way more useful, in particular the units defending within the city's territory, and the city cannot be put under siege and the additional range strike. Those could be very, very strong. Um, but again, if you're investing in Victor for purely defensively, uh, for purely defensive purposes, you're not investing in some of these other people who could potentially be getting you a lot more. I would say in terms of Victor, um, Garrison Commander, Defense Logistics, and Embrasure, these three are your go-tos. These two, less good, in my opinion. Mm, I wouldn't even really bother with these ever. I think these are basically inconsequential to the outcome of the game, pretty much 99% of the time, and you should never, ever waste a point on these. In all honesty, whenever I get Victor, I pretty much just put one or two points in him to get the Garrison Commander, and that's it. That's all I put into him. 99% of the time, I just put one point in him um, for the City Combat Strength Defense and the... Uh, government Plaza building the audience chamber, I believe, where you get the plus one amenity, plus four housing, and uh, stuff like that. That would be the only reason I would put a single point into Victor, is usually to grab this. So, that's Victor. Uh, let's talk about Amani. Uh, Amani is another 
a governor that I very, very rarely get use out of. Um, again, Amani has potential and can be very useful. Um, but the way that I play in that I avoid war, uh, specifically because war is easy and I want to try to win the game without going to war, that she... Uh, where, where am I going with this? Why, why is that relevant? It's, it's because... I forget why that's relevant, but there's a reason... There's a reason... There's a reason that they're linked. Um, being able to... Being able to meet a city-state and then immediately get the plus three benefit uh, from having... Or getting the, the benefit from having three envoys, for example, the Suzerain bonus, is actually really, really nice. Um, the problem is that on deity or higher, higher difficulties, the AI just have so many envoys that they're going to outcompete you pretty much every time. So, you know, it's something you got to kind of be careful and balance. Um, in terms of her other abilities, these can be okay. I would say that I've almost never used any of these, and I've only ever used Prestige and Promoter. 99% of the time, when I use Amani, I literally just put one point in her, and again, use her for the plus one amenity and plus four housing from the audience chamber. That's like, Almost every time I use her, that's what I use her for. And I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't bother doing anything else. Now, when it comes to Moksha, he is specifically religious victory oriented. And actually, in that space, he's pretty damn good. Because he lets you multiply your religious pressure, which is, you know, not bad. It's not exactly hugely consequential, but for for an ability, it's 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 okay. Um, in terms of Divine Architect, I um, I don't bother with this. I also don't bother with Citadel of God. I would be much more interested in getting down here to Apostles, getting one extra promotion. That's, if I was going for a religious victory, this would be the one that I would be looking for, because a lot of promotions on Apostles would be really, really nice with regards to getting a uh, religion victory, because you could get extra spread charges, you could get extra theological combat strength. This, this is just really, really good. So I would say, if you're going for a religious victory, you almost certainly want to get Moksha up to the Patron Saint ability so that you can train Apostles with uh, lots of abilities. We already talked about Magnus, um, which is pretty good. Now, Liang is probably who I would consider to be the competitor for my number two spot. Um, getting plus one Builder Charge is just a way to turn, make your make your builders more efficient, right? If you're spending, uh, every time you build a builder, the price of the build, next builder goes up. So if you're building a builder for 50 production for three build charges, the next build is going to cost 52 production for three build charges. So you're going to spend like 100 production for six build charges. Liang can make that so you spend 102 production for eight build charges. It's just more efficient. And it really depends on what phase of the game you are in. I kind of like to get Liang early because it lets me be a little bit less... Um, a little bit less pained about building um, builders. Now, she also has a really, 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 really nice set of abilities here. She's actually probably one of the most flexibly powerful in the sense that her abilities aren't super powerful, but they all... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's possible there's, there's a plurality of situations that you can get value out of them, right? There's a lot of different situations that Liang can provide you with value. So, for example, if you look at infrastructure here, 30% um, production towards city center and governor plaza, government plaza buildings is um, just always really, really handy because you're going to want to build those as soon as possible and getting an extra 30% production towards them is pretty nice. That's a pretty okay bonus. Like, if you don't have anything else to spend your abilities on, this isn't a bad one. I'll just move her around and build things. Um, zoning Commissioner, again, another one. 30% uh, production towards building districts in the city. Pretty damn good. Not going to complain about it. Um, quite good. You know? I would say these these three are her most... Or these three, if you include her all builder charges thing, are her most powerful abilities. Now, I actually don't value the aquaculture at all. Uh, food is probably my least... One of my least valued resources in the game. Um, I think you're essentially wasting builder charges if you're building fisheries. 
if you want to go right ahead there are situations in which i would consider building fisheries if i had a coastal city that didn't really have a lot of food and needed it or had a lot of plains hills and needed some sort of food tiles or something to keep it sustained then i would maybe consider the fishery but i think this is just a waste of a governor title and a waste of a builder charge if you do this and then by extension amusement isn't very good either although amusement can be pretty good now if you're trying to build some you know water park buildings and parks and recreation eh, this can th these this can be okay if you're going for some sort of um cultural victory because of the appeal and stuff like that and the culture and the amenity is uh you know these are these are all things that could help but really it, for me it's about these production these production boosts towards districts because these will actually stack with any chops and magnus can't be anywhere can't, can't be everywhere can't be anywhere magnus can't be everywhere so a little bit of extra chop power um through the yang isn't terrible now pingala is probably my other sort of second tier uh, governor because with a single point you just get 20% science and culture uh, very often if I don't have very often if I don't have a particular need for a, a governor I'll just grab Pingala and then stick him in my strongest city with regards to science and culture because just the extra little bit of science and culture is really nice connoisseur and researcher less so useful because the problem is that this 20% increase in science and culture is kind of antagonistic with this again it's kind of like the Magnus situation where you want this guy to sit still in your best city for production for producing science and culture but then these things kind of want you to move them around to get value out of them and then grants is sort of another one where you just want to sit him still to generate a bunch of great people points but these are telling you to move them around so it's just kind of a bit of a mess um in terms of the play styles and gameplay that he's incentivizing the player to go towards so i would recommend you know basically considering this a dead promotion uh put one point into him uh if you're going for a scientific victory obviously go for space space in initiative i don't think arms race really you should ever put a point in arms race i think that's a waste <clears throat> But certainly if you're going for a tourism victory, I would at least go up to Grants and then stick them into the city with the most um, great people districts. Um, like with the city that is generating the most great people points. And then if you're going for a science victory, you obviously want to get all the way down to Space Initiative. Now in terms of Reyna, she is what I consider like my tier 3. So if Magnus is tier 1, Liang and Pingala are tier 2, Reyna is tier 3, and then these other ones are more situational slash low tier. For example, Moksha is obviously a tier 1 religious guy, but these two are kind of like the low tiers. But if you're not going for religion victory, Moksha is literally just put one point in him and use him for the uh, governor uh, amenity and housing from the audience chamber. Now Reyna. Reyna is... <sighs> Reyna is a problem. Because she's actually really good to invest into. But but if you're going to get her and get value out of her, you have to invest into her. With regards to a tourism victory, she is very nice to stick her in your capital, for example. And to get the extra double tourism from all the works of art, music and writing. Um, with regards to general use i almost always put one point in her then i get a harbor master then i get tax collector and then i'll have one city that's on the coastline with a commercial hub and a harbor and where i try to get as high a population as possible just to maximize how much gold i get out of her contractor is actually really really powerful for going for a scientific victory because you can purchase a spaceport in a single turn i think it's about 7200 gold on standard speed which is pretty damn nice a nice value it's very easy to get that much gold with the other abusable mechanics in the expansion so she's another one of these people she's kind of she's she's a very high high tier um governor but you have to invest into her and that's the thing so for example i would say i almost never go for foreign exchange i almost always go for although i'm pretty sure this works on your own trade route so it could be worth you know if you if you manipulated your trade routes and stuff like that i don't go to that level of micromanagement just because i don't think the return is the return on investment is high enough uh, but reg with regards to harbor master i'll almost always because i'm picking this up i'll have a city that has a commercial hub and harbor in a triangle with the city center to get the maximum amount of benefit um, and then tax collector is just nice so in almost every single game i will get her to tax collector and then depending on the game i'm going for i will either go for contractor or curator if i'm going for a space race or sorry a tourism victory i will go for curator if i'm going for a space race i will go for contractor just so i can purchase my spaceport in the late game 
Um, but that's pretty much all of the basics of governors. I don't think there's really a huge amount to talk about when it comes to governors um, beyond this. Um, because it's very, very situational. Um, and I would have to give examples. So... Like, for example, if we talk about the early game, you're going to have somewhere in the region of... By the time you hit political philosophy, you're going to have somewhere in the region of two to four governor titles. And for me, that will almost always be two points in Magnus, two provision, then either a point in Liang a point or a point in Pingala. Um, yeah, I will almost always go two points in Magnus, one point in Liang or Pingala, and then the next point in whichever one of these two uh, I didn't pick. So I would, I would have something like this. For example, let me just assign you so I can. Um, I'll, I'll get the early game setup that I usually use. So this is kind of like what my early game governor setup would look like. I would have Magnus so I can do chop abuse and be able to chop out settlers without consuming uh, population. I will almost never go higher than this. This is all I will invest into Magnus for the entire game. I'll put one point into the Yang because if I'm ever building a builder, I can just move her around and get the builder uh, to have an extra charge. Uh, and then Pingala is just nice because I can plop him in a city and get 20% science and culture. Following on from that, um, I will almost always, when it comes to stuff like recorded history and defensive tactics, I will either... Um, promote up to infrastructure on Liang if I plan on building more government plazas buildings or it'll kind of be very situational I might I might promote um, I might promote up to for example grants here on Pingala if I'm generating great people points so it, it's kind of situational it, it's hard to really explain it's really it's it's quite difficult to make sort of definitive statements on the order and exact strategy of how to use governors because the situation that you're in is going to dictate exactly the best way to use them and that's really something you're only going to learn and build up the knowledge for through playing many 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 games of DD Civ 6 um and i still don't even have the full knowledge of that like i'm still working on that so don't don't assume that i know exactly the best order because i i sincerely do not now, uh, let me see, is there anything else I want to cover? No. Uh, so I will just cut to me showing off the Magnus chop abuse. Okay, so I have here set up, I have Magnus in place in the city, I have a builder on top of a forest, I have ancient walls, one turn from finishing, and we are ready to go. So if we take a quick look over here at this builder, this is a 68 production chop uh, for these ancient walls. If we go ahead and take a look at this builder, because Magnus is present, it's 136 production, okay? Now, what's going to happen here is that the ancient walls... Let me just grab up the calculator here so I can show this in more detail. This 130, 136 production, okay, is going to get multiplied by 2 because we have the limes card slotted in here, which is 100% production towards defensive buildings, okay? Then the... Uh, Seven production, the seven, eight production is going to be subtracted from it, okay, to leave us with 264. And then the 10.5 is going to be added. So we're going to have 274 overflow to put into something like the Apadana, which is the example I'm going to use, which is a 359 production wonder. So let's chop here, okay. And now you can see we're building the Apadana in eight turns. I'm going to place it down. Now it says zero here. I, I don't know how to actually get this to update on the same turn. Maybe if I click here a little bit, I will probably have to wait until next turn. But if I go to next turn, what you'll see is that this will basically fill up with that overflow. And we'll have about, I think it'll maybe do two turns. So we'll probably have like 285 production invested into it next turn. So let's just have a look at that and see if we can prove that just to show you guys how the overflow works this should all jump up should see the production of the actual wonder will like skyrocket along oh come on be annoying yeah and you can see here i was i was actually right in the 10 point 
the 270. I wasn't exactly right, but it was, it's close enough to that where you'll get the point where um, the overflow went into the wonder and we got it a lot faster than we should have. So that's how the, that's why Magnus is so strong. That's that production overflow in action. And I hope that really explains why Magnus should always be your top tier choice, your first choice, and you should be using the chopping mechanics to the full of their benefits. Um, all things that multiply production work with this chop abuse mechanic and the overflow. So don't be afraid to get so kind of crazy. One thing I haven't tried is if uh, overflow, uh, sorry, I just did an experiment right here to see if this overflow works and it looks like that doesn't also multiply the thingy uh, as far as I can tell because the numbers came out without any multipliers if it if, a, if another multiplier was being applied it would look like something like this I would have be at about 315 production but because I'm at 270 it didn't work but yeah I gotta call that an end to this uh, little guide video. If you have any questions or clarifications or suggestions or information that you think I missed or didn't cover, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Other than that, though, I want to say I love you all very much, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.